Here we are. So hello everyone. My name is Linda Detweiler. I am a chemistry and physics teacher of 10 years and now I'm the customer success manager at Pivot Interactives. And today, kind of starting off in that instructional strategies, last time we met, we talked about how to get started with a tech tool. So I think about that as the before I ever even get into the classroom, this is how I get started. Today, we're going to focus on how do I plan for a tech tool? So today's mindset is where does pivot fall into my unit plan when we talk about that balanced educational experience that is our classroom where does pivot fall in and the answer to that question is yes pivot falls into a lot of different places it is all about how you use it so just like you can take an egg and put an egg into breakfast lunch dinner snack dessert whatever you want pivot can go into a lot of different places in your classroom it's all about how you present it how your students use it and how you evaluate it so that's what we're going to focus on today give you some tips on lesson planning in general and then tips about using pivot and then we're actually going to work through a physics lesson plan a physics really unit plan but we'll get into semantics later now, Linda, this is a PowerPoint presentation. How could you? I have zero intentions of reading from a PowerPoint presentation. It has never been my style. It will never be my style. This is to help keep me from wandering down the rabbit hole. So I highly recommend check out this presentation. I'm gonna put the link in the chat again so that you can follow along. I have hyperlinked a lot of things to this, including the original research paper that was used to form the 5e instructional model so if you are looking for like you're like me you want to read the original stuff all of that is in here i highly recommend you check it out i've also added additional links and additional resources by all means have at it and so what on earth are we going to do today linda today we're going to talk about the 5e instructional model and if you've never heard of it don't feel bad I feel like the 5e instructional model is the way we learn to teach. It's just somebody gave it an acronym. And for me as an educator, that's kind of how a lot of things in education are. Like they are what you intuitively know. It's just somebody came along and they discovered it. So they slapped a name on it. Turns out it's been discovered every 10 years. Highly recommend at some point, go find a teaching textbook from the 1980s or the 1970s read it you'll be like oh man this is the exact same thing we're dealing with right now somebody just gave it a different word there's nothing new in education except for technology and even then is it really new we're going to talk about what is active learning which i think is the bedrock of a classroom is the active component in our learning process and avoiding passive learning we're going to talk about how pivot is active learning and then we're going to talk about where does pivot fit into each of these five e's because when we look at engagement exploration explanation elaboration evaluation a lot of people are like well pivots a lab not really but then again a lab isn't the thing that you think it is which is fine so I'm going to show you how I would fit pivot into different parts of my classroom and I encourage you to consider thinking of ways to fit pivot throughout your room in different places throughout the year and we'll talk about why later. When you have questions, if you have questions, two things. Option one, you can unmute and ask. It's perfectly fine. Option two, you can drop them in the chat. I do see the chat. I do read the chat so I can come back to those and see them there. So either option is perfectly fine. Linda, what the heck is the 5e instructional model? Fairly simple. The 5e instructional model has five E's. There is engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate. Now I chose to do a model approach where it's four E's with one in the middle and it's the circular component. The idea is that generally speaking, where you come in doesn't matter but it all evolves around evaluation the old model for the 5e model is that it's linear and it starts at engage and always ends in evaluation but i think that when we look at the 5e instructional model as 
I have to do an engagement. I have to do an exploration. I have to do an explanation. I have to do an elaboration. And then I have to end an evaluation. We forget that we evaluate with every single thing we do in our classroom. We forget that evaluation is more than just the unit test at the end. That it's more than just, I did a final project. There are multiple ways to evaluate and your evaluation doesn't need to be the last thing in your unit, particularly if you're working with younger students, it can be really helpful to have your summative evaluation sooner and then do elaborations that allow you to go past so that your students who have got it can grow and your students that need more help, you can circle back and re-engage. So I like to think of it as a circular model. I tend to enter the model in engage or explore. I tend to enter the model there. It's not a requirement. You could start a unit and elaborate and then circle wherever you want to. But most people will enter in engagement. So that's where we're gonna get started today. So what the heck is engagement? Engagement is not what I always thought it was. Like when I went and read the definition and looked up the research paper, I thought of engagement as that fun demo you do at the start of class to get them hooked. Kind of like your attention seeker at the beginning of the room, like let's go do gummy bears, the gummy bear experiment where you put gummy bears in a test tube and add potassium, was it potassium chlorate, I think. You know, it lights it on fire. By the way, really fun demo. Please do it inside of a fume hood. Please wear goggles. Please do not have your students hold said test tube. Please make sure it is not pointed near any of your students, no matter how much you dislike them. That is something for you to do and for them to watch. I thought of that as engagement, but it turns out that's not what the original author considered to be engagement. Engagement is where we go back and find out what they already know. We're going to engage their prior knowledge. So engagement is like your pretest. It could still be that demo. I like to think of there's a really fun demo that you can do with diet soda and regular soda for density. Take a fish tank, put your two soda cans in there, one floats, one sinks. And then I'd have my students tell me, what are all of the observations you can come up with right now relating to density? What I'm doing in that moment is I am getting them hooked, which is good. We do have to sell our subject to these students. So I'm getting them hooked, but I'm also allowing them to tell me what they already know. And this can be really helpful, particularly if I'm teaching a subject where they do have very set prior information coming in. Coming from middle school, I expect my students to have an understanding of what density is. I expect that they know that for something to be dense, it means it is compact. It has the sensation of being heavy. And that they probably know how to calculate solid densities of regular objects. If I give them a cube, they could probably give me the density. But if I give them a Lego, they're going to look at me like I just sprouted a second head. If I give them oil, they're not going to know what to do. And heaven forbid, I ask them to find the density of the air around them. They're out of luck. So I know that there are areas that I can go farther, but I need to figure out what's their starting point. I also know that that starting point is going to look a lot different this year than it did two years ago. Like, let's just be perfectly honest. COVID messed up a lot of things. And one of them is this whole concept of prior knowledge. I taught sophomore chemistry. That means that my students right now, if they walked into the room last year, they were freshmen and they had a normal freshman year, but they missed out on pretty much all of eighth grade which screws me royally because eighth grade is physical science. That means realistically, they got nothing for physical science. So when they come in and they say, hey, Miss D, I got no clue what density is. They're not lying. I'm used to my kids coming in and being like, oh, I don't know anything. 
I just, my last teacher sucked. No, they didn't. I see them in the hallway. I shake their hands. We do vertical alignment. I know that they're a good teacher. It's not their fault this year. Like they honestly did not get that information. And we're going to have to deal with that for a couple of years. So whatever you're like, you should have learned this in fourth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade. You're right. They should have. But COVID. So for the next couple of years, when people are asking you to analyze your data, but COVID is probably going to be my go to until we can work through the students that would have gotten to that point. So I'm going to figure out just what do they know, and that's my baseline. Typically inside of my classroom, I see 30 to 40% growth from the baseline. So if you think of it as like I gave a unit assessment, by the end of the unit assessment, I can go from a 30 to a 70 or a 30 to an 80 with my AP students. I'm going to see growth. And I would expect that growth to be the same growth that you have seen in previous years. You're starting at a lower point. So I'm going to use this to set my baseline and then set my goals and adjust within there. This is also where you're going to find misconceptions and gaps. So maybe they have a misconception that all dense things are heavy. Like no matter what you do, if you pick up something that's dense, it's, it's going to be so heavy you can't pick it up because they know that a brick is dense and a brick is heavy and bricks are hard to pick up because when they were in fourth grade and they picked up a cinder block, it was heavy and hard to pick up. Therefore, all dense things must be heavy and hard to pick up. Not the case, but that's a misconception. It's a misconception that makes sense because when they developed it, it was true for that situation but it's not always true so we want to find out what those are and intentionally plan for them and we also want to find gaps maybe they know how to calculate density they know what density is but they don't know how to find density inside of a lab perfectly fine they don't know how to find the mass or they don't realize that the balance that gives it to them in grams, that's the mass. Okay, that's a gap. Gaps are easy to fill in. Gaps take two minutes to fill in. So that's what I'm doing here. This could be your area where you spark joy in their lives. It doesn't have to be. This is just where you're pulling in that prior knowledge. So the next one, I think this is where most of us truly think of as getting started teaching. This is the exploration phase. Exploration is simply where you start like diving into something. This is your notes. This is your lab. This is your let's go do a web quest. Does anybody still do web quests in their classroom? I did. But this is where we allow them to literally explore the information that's available. Oftentimes we give that in a very direct fashion. My classroom, we would start every unit with some amount of direct instruction, whether that's I'm teaching you that fire is hot, please do not put your hand in the flame. Or I'm teaching you, here are a bunch of different types of woods. What do you notice? Well, this one's super thick and dense. This one's super light. I've got cork wood and cedar wood and they feel them in their hands and they're like, aha, that's what that means. This is dense because it's compact and this one's less dense, it's less compact. Whatever that is for your exploration, that's here. I would say that typically teachers spend the most time inside of the exploration because it's easy. The exploration phase is the, is the part that we can really structure take control over and therefore if we can take control over it we can affect it the most this is a great area for us to have that rigidity rigidity and control and say yes we are going to do step one then two then three for the control people like me high control area this is fantastic for my mental sanity however this the important thing inside of here is that students are gaining their base knowledge for the unit 
So it's important that we make sure that there are checks that they are actually getting that base knowledge. Exit tickets, mini quizzes, talk to them, listen to their conversations, whatever it is that you're doing to just check in and be like, yep, that's the right knowledge. We're good. You want something to make sure that they've at least gotten most of it. Now, the next step is ex explanation. This is like in a mini evaluation. And explain, we're going to take everything that they learned prior and connect it to everything we just taught them. So a great example of this is when I do density with my chem students, my engage is I hand them a wooden block and tell them, I want to know what type of wood this is. I give them a table of densities and they go forth and conquer. And they come back and they tell me what type of wood it is. They also make density sets that I have found online where you can get a whole bunch of different materials, does the same thing. They're all cubes. They're kind of nice. The downside is the brass one is really sharp. That was my engage. From there, we then paired into a Lego. I said, okay, let's think of how working with a Lego is different than working with a cube. Let's figure out how to find the densities of a Lego. All the little nooks and crannies and there's air pockets inside of the tiny Legos and how do I affect this? Now, once I'm done with that, I'm going to move into a liquid. My liquid density is my explain area. We learned how to work with a solid cube, with a regular shape solid cube. We worked with that they know how to find density. Then we worked with an irregular solid, which means that they had to do density and find volume by displacement with an irregular solid. Pro tip for the irregular solid with density, sand works really well. Really fine grater sand that you get at Lowe's, the orange bags of paper sand works really well for that. Just let it dry out so that it's not as sticky, but the sand gets into the nooks and crevices of your solid way better. And it's still, it's a fluid, it's still going to take the shape of the container. So you can put the Lego in there, put your hand over top of it, shake it. It also cleans up better because you can just tap the Lego a couple of times. All the sand comes out, you don't have to wait for the Lego to dry. So fun thing there. But once we've done a Lego, now we're going to do a liquid. They find the density of vegetable oil. That's my explain because we're taking the information of what is density, what they already know. We're bringing in that new method using a graduated cylinder to find volume and knowing that sometimes I need to find an initial and a final and do a difference. Now we're going to tweak that for a liquid. But instead of having to find the initial and final with volume, finding the initial and volume and final with mass. So that becomes my explain. These also traditionally are where you're going to do quizzes or you're going to have some kind of like long winded claim evidence reasoning paragraph. That's a great place for that here too. I like to include this within the same day or a day or two after explore depending on the length of my unit my explain is sometime in the first quarter because i want them to make that initial connection early on so that i have a strong evaluation tool to go back and connect so if i need to explore more we can circle back or if we're ready to move on we can elaborate the sooner you get those initial formative assessments the faster you can move I love the fact that um, Pivot Interactive is like giving the questions, you know, and they can get instant feedback. Yep. Um, but, you know, to do the Pivot Lab in an explore stage, I feel like they require a really strong background to be able to do it. Like at least the foundation, let's say, for example, um, uh, motion. Okay, yep. so they're going to figure out the speed of a, the average speed of a car. So. Mm -hmm. Like I have to teach them the formula, how to figure it out. And they have to know the graphing, you know, um, a strong math. 
Oh yeah, at, no. at least at least an average math skills, you know. And, yeah, and they figured, need like, something. They need something above base level. Yeah. So so I I stopped using Pivot Lab in Explore stage. Mm -hmm. Rather than you know, rather I start using it during the Explain stage, like you know. Absolutely. Um, yeah, given the info, new information, and then as a backup or as a practice, you know. Let me show you. This is actually a great one because it. It's going to go with both of the things you just talked about. Oop. Yeah. Oop. Okay. So this is one of my favorites for starting off with kinematics. I probably have talked about this activity to death for kinematics. Mine is physical science, by the way. Oh, you have perfect. This is just, you do, yeah, easy you going on first or physics first in physical science. Well, I change It's trial and error, which one yeah. works best. So I believe chemistry works best because I start from universe, starting small, getting bigger, you know. Um, so the second semester is probably uh, the better. So, yeah. One of the cool things about physical science when I did it, I did chem first, then physics. Mostly I did chem first because my background was in chemistry. So it gave me four months to build myself up to, I have to teach freshman physics. Deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> so it gave me time to just sink into that mindset. But one of the cool things, particularly about kinematics in a physical science class is that the difference between velocity and density, teaching them those skills is just the word. I quit teaching my students like velocity is distance over time. Instead, I gave them a formula like we did in density. And then I said, okay, from this formula, how do you think you would find velocity? Well, I need to find a mass, I need to find a volume, and then I'm going to divide them. Cool. So then what do you think the definition of density is? It's a mass per unit volume. Cool. So what does that mean? What would something that's more dense be? Oh, that's the more mass in the less volume, the better it's going to be. Cool. We can apply that same skill to physics inside of velocity and acceleration because it's just breaking down a formula but where pivot comes into this is you want to make sure you're picking an activity that is designed to be an introduction when you're inside of that explain step you want to make sure that you're picking something or the explore step that you're picking something that is meant to be an introduction because we have so many activities particularly in something like physics. So if I go physics, kinematics, there are 70 different activities that you could pick from. But if I go instructional cycle early, I'm gonna find the ones that are designed to be done at the beginning. The reason for that, when you look at this guy here, that's meant to be done at the beginning, it's actually going to teach them we discussed motion of terms using three terms, position, velocity, acceleration. These activities are actually going to introduce it. So this activity is going to teach them, how would you stop? This is gonna give them the, the formula for velocity. It is gonna give them the symbolic version of it so that it does build it, but not all of our kinematics activities are done like this. Some of our kinematics activities are meant to be an assessment. So you really wanna make sure that you're like, pick in a physics activity that is for this. The other thing is when you're in that explore phase, we want them to be exploring the concept, not the product. So if I'm doing something like a pivot in the explore stage, the first time I'm doing it, I'm showing them how to use the platform, they're going to spend less time exploring the science and more time exploring the platform the first time you're in there. So just showing them like, hey, this is the video. It comes with a stopwatch and a meter stick. And there are multiple trials that you can pick from. When you hit play, it plays. And I can, I pause it automatically using the space bar, but I could pause it on the screen. I can drag this to back it up or I can use the left and right arrow keys. Obliterated, look at that. Showing them those things early on will help to remove the, I need to explore the platform and allow them to focus on, I want to explore the science.
And even if that's just at the start of a new pivot, you tell them go find the first video instance and just play with it for two minutes. That would be fantastic. I see a question I've never seen pivot. Do you have a webinar where you just click around and show us what they are about? I do actually, and that would be a great one from last week and it will be posted hopefully tonight as soon as I get it edited. <laughs> so it is coming, but yes, we do have a whole bunch of uh, videos on our YouTube channel where you can just see me playing around with it. But yeah, that would be my big thing for explore is pick something that's designed to be an introduction and just give them a minute to get it out of their system and let them explore the platform particularly with the videos where they're just playing with like, I can take this and chuck it off the screen and bring it back and chuck it off the screen and bring it back. By the way, if they do set it off the screen and they can't get it back, just have them click on the button and it comes back. So very often I've had the kids tell me like, oh, I broke it. I can't find my ruler anymore, Miss Detweiler. Click, click, it's back. They can unbreak. <laughs> Any other questions inside of here? You mentioned 30 to 40% growth of the, pre, uh, of the baseline. Are you giving a pretest for every unit? Most units, yes. Inside of my AP class, absolutely. Um, when I taught with my AP students, I use the assessments that are inside a college board, but yeah, I definitely give some kind of pretest. With my standard students, my pretest is a little bit more informal. That's the here's a demo tell me what do you know and i get a feel of like this is where i expected them to be i expected them to know this information turns out they didn't i have work to do or they did really good that's fantastic for ap it was multiple choice at the beginning of the year after about unit two with my ap physics students unit two gets me to halloween after unit two i'm introducing frqs and after unit, what would that be? Unit four for AP Physics one. So unit four is energy that gets me through Christmas. When we get back from Christmas, I issue multiple choice questions for pretests and only give them FRQs. And those FRQs, when they have that long form where they can talk themselves into circles, I can see where their logic goes and stops and spins back on itself. So I like to ask open ended questions and just do one or two. So that I can see where they're like i'm going good i'm going good and I drop off because at that drop off moment, they will continue to refer back to the stuff that they know for certain. And that's my point where i'm like aha ha, ha. this circle point is where they don't feel as confident. And it's also the point where I need to build. Are you grading all of these? I am kind of grading them. They're not getting a score, that's for certain. I'm grading them in a pile method where I look at it as I see this as good, they got it, not good, they didn't get it, in between. And so as I'm reading through them, I'll grade them. I was an AP grader, so I'm pretty quick at grading multiple choice questions. It takes me about a minute. So for, or for grading uh, FRQs, it takes me about a minute so on FRQs, I'm absolutely grading them completely using the rubric just because I have that practice and speed built up. But for some of them, not so much. What are good resources for pretests in non AP classes? That's a really great question. Let me find this book really quick. Uh, there it is. All right. I got two of them. This is the first one. This is Science Formative Assessments. It's by Paige Keeley. It's from NSTA. You can find it on Amazon. Fantastic book. You can see mine's got covered in bookmarks. Um, there are a ton of formative assessment techniques in here. These are great for bell works, for exit tickets, for in the middle of class, all kinds of stuff. Fantastic one. The other one. I don't see it off the top of my head. The other one is another Paige Keeley book. And it's 
essentially tippers. If you're a physics teacher, tippers is fantastic. There's tippers and there's end tippers. They're from Pearson. They are like $35 a book. It's a blue book. End tippers is Newtonian tippers. Couldn't tell you what tipper stands for. Um, but they are these kind of like great CER questions. They're comparison questions. So it could be a ranking task. It could be a, you know, compare A with B, whatever. Paige Keeley has a whole set of them for middle school and high school. And for each of the subjects, she has a chemistry one, a physical science one, a life science one, and they're all student A and student B has XYZ going on, which one's correct, or is no one correct, why or why not? One of those questions makes the perfect pretest. Just one. You don't need a ton of them. One to two questions where they just argue, claim evidence reasoning once, you will get so much info. I have the Tipper's book. Uh, Tipper's is by, oh, don't ask me to pronounce that, Heigelick. This is the Tipper's book. Once you buy the book, reach out to Pearson and ask them for the answer key. Uh, yeah, this is the regular Tipper's sense making task for introductory physics the other one is n tippers and it has a different front point fantastic book worth every dime you also will find these books at your local thrift stores check out goodwill those kinds of things you will find them i got both of these on amazon tippers is 1p it's t-i-p-e-r-s Yeah, Pearson series in educational innovation. I'll put the link in the uh, in the email. Absolutely. Yeah, you can see behind me. I have all these books. Those are all teaching books, with the exception of all the D and D books that are right there. But tons of good resources. I got almost all of those at thrift stores. There are a couple of these that I picked up, like personally purchased off of Amazon, things like tippers, but most of them I bought at thrift stores. I found, I spent a buck on them and had them. So you'll be amazed the teaching resources you get by just going through the textbook section of your local thrift store. All right, the next question is on elaboration. So this is where the kids go above and beyond. I like to see elaboration as this is where they're applying their knowledge, but this is also a great point. If I'm thinking of the five E's in a nonlinear model. My students engaged, they explored, they explained. They explained did not go according to plan. That will be student group A. I'm shifting them back to explore and we're going to re-engage, re-explore, re-explain. Those kids are going to just er, right up here and come back to that wheel. And I'm putting them back so that I can catch, recapture and grow. The students who they explained went well. They did it, they did good, awesome. I'm going to send them off into Elaborate. Yes, Tippers is only a physics book, I think for right now. I don't know, I'll have to look into that, but I've only ever heard of it for physics. I wish I had that other book within hand reach. I've got so many books inside this room, it's ridiculous. So with the elaborate, the students who did good, now I'm going to let them grow. So in that density model that we've talked about, this is where my students did great with liquids. Awesome. Welcome to gases. Gases are funky because gases can be compressed, which means I can compress this and I can learn, I can see how that affects the density of the gas. There's a really great activity that you can do with a bike pump and a two liter bottle. Downside, if you overpressurize that two liter bottle, it will explode. And it sounds like a true bomb going off, at least to people who've never heard a bomb going off. So if you do that, set like a limit or have a pressure, get like actual bottles that are meant to be pressurized so that the seal will break rather than the bottle will break. But 
really simple thing. You just take a wheel uh, stem for a bike, put it into your bottle, seal it with super glue or putty and screw it on so that when it when you pump air in the air doesn't come out. So like I said, the elaborate portion is a great time where you can kind of split your course into two groups. Let the kids that didn't get it come back and let the kids who did get it grow. This is the difference in my class, by the way, if you're doing standards based grading between proficient and distinguished. Students that move on into the elaborate phase, they're in my distinguished category. Students that go back and need to recapture are in my proficient category. Students who go back recapture and still don't quite get it are in my apprentice category. Students who all out refuse are in my novice category. So if you're doing standards based grading, elaboration is the perfect area to distinguish that mastery versus I got it. The difference between these are my top echelon students and these are my students that are meeting expectations. The last category is evaluation and evaluation, like I've said, happens all throughout. Everything we do is an evaluation. Now, granted, do we typically only do one or two summative evaluations? Absolutely. However, everything in your class is an evaluation. If you ask a question and you get information from the kid, you have evaluated their knowledge. Every conversation, everything collected, they're all evaluations. It simply comes down to how you use it. Even your pivot activities are evaluations and they are probably the more traditional evaluations because they are multiple choice and open-ended questions. So everything that you do is an evaluation. Now, evaluate is no longer at the end. And like I said before, evaluation is that thing that we're constantly bubbling back into. And that's because it's part of that balanced assessment plan. We're not thinking of evaluation as this, like we have to get to the unit test at the end, guys. Evaluation becomes our point that we're constantly kind of coming back into in using in different fashions. Everything that you collect, everything that you don't collect. My favorite evaluations are to hear the off topic conversations or when the off topic conversations happen, because that's the point where the students need the most help, because if they're off topic, it means that they either know it and they don't need to go back over it or they don't know it and they do. So I like to find out where are they getting off topic and why. Now, just like with everything in education, there are limitations to the 5E model. So I want to talk about these really quickly. The 5E model is most effective when students are encountering new concepts. It is not great for review. If they already know everything that's coming out of your mouth, this isn't the thing for that. The 5E model was also designed to work as a unit. So while we talk about the 5E model as a lesson plan, it was always designed to be a unit arc. It was always designed that the lesson would take multiple days. So it was never meant to cover all five of these in a class period. When you think about that 50 minutes to cover all five of these, that is 10 minutes per thing. We don't, we're not going to get through a whole arc in 10 minutes. I might spend three days in my explain step, I might spend a week in explore in exploration. It's all going to vary. Also, if too much time is spent in one phase, the structure is not effective. If you look at your unit and you've got four weeks dedicated for energy, and if I come back over here, if I have four weeks dedicated to energy, I spend a day evaluating anything that they do but we spend three weeks in exploration, I'm not going to get the most effective information because all they did was absorb knowledge. I've got to give them a chance to apply it and do other things with it. So balance is a key here. You really do want to try to aim for 20% for each one. If you would like the original study, you will find that here. 
but I've also included some other information from other sources about how they use the 5e instructional model so that you can see other ways that it's used. So now let's talk about where pivot falls into all this so pivot focuses on active engagement throughout our entire platform so the idea is that. In the classroom, we think of a lab where like we're going to go do a lab. I'm going to dehydrate mag I'm going to do a single replacement reaction with magnesium make magnesium oxide and I'm going to figure out the percent composition or I'm going to figure out my yield or whatever. Very like I'm going to set up this lab, the kids are going to do it they're going to get their data they're going to calculate it done. A lot of times we treat labs as essentially elaborate math problems. That's not the goal of pivot. The goal of pivot is to get the students to actively engage inside of their learning in multiple different avenues. That might be data collection, that might be the math, that might be the pre lab, that might just be evaluating the setup. Pivot is the thing that we wanted to spend time on in class, but we couldn't because the setup takes too long. Getting the data takes too long. The lab is dangerous and I need to focus on making sure my kids don't light themselves on fire with magnesium, whatever. Pivot takes all of those concerns, moves them out of the way so that I can focus on the actual learning and the questions that I could really ask and get those great answers rather than, hey, I need you to move that crucible make sure there's a lid on it stop staring at the magnesium fire you're gonna get a headache you're gonna hurt your eyes i'm spending less time focusing on that and more time focusing on so what are the safety concerns of lighting magnesium on fire and how could we mitigate them and i did include the research article on active engagement so what does that look like in pivot what we can do is that we can instead of having to set all of this up that's a speaker there's this uh spring going on which by the way you can buy these springs and you could make this whole setup in your classroom it's going to take you 15 20 minutes just to set it up but even if you set it up you're not going to be able to pause the wave as it's going and put a ruler over top of it I would love to like that would be super legit. I don't have the ability to just stop time. If I did, I might actually get to sleep more. But I can make all of these variations inside a pivot and get really good data with it, and I can't do that inside of my classroom. So let's look at an example. So. Let's say I want to engage my students. We want to look at engagement in my classroom. This is a really cool one. This is a new activity that just came out. It's on thermal conductivity. And here's the background story that I tell my students. I tell my students, we are going to take this metal rod and light it on fire. Ta da! When is it still safe for me to touch? that or that part right there because i tell my students the moment we have a bunsen burner in my room all glassware is considered hot until told otherwise all metal objects are considered hot until told otherwise because no matter how many times i tell them don't touch the rod it's hot i get that kid that comes in and grabs the metal rod and burns themselves and then the parent comes up how dare you and now I've got to explain to some parent why their 16 year old grabbed a metal rod and hurt themselves. That takes time out of my day. So we look at it in pivot and I ask them how how can we know when this is too hot to touch. And their answer is well, you can just touch it and if it burns you it's too hot to touch and i'm like that is a fantastic observation we'll write that one on the board what's another method that's a that like decreases my liability. And they're like, well, you can put your hand up to it and feel the heat. I'm like, fantastic. But most things are considered too hot to touch at about 35 degrees centigrade, um, which is like just above that point. 
but it's not hot enough for you to really like put your hand up to it without touching it and feel a heat emanating from it. Typically when we think about something that's going to emanate heat, we're like 50, 70 degrees centigrade. It's super freaking hot. It's obviously not a touch thing. And then somebody goes, well, you could get those like night optic thermal things. And I'm like, that's fantastic. Give me your 20 grand. We'll go buy one for everybody in the room right now. We'll get thermal imaging in our classroom. Lo and behold, my district doesn't have thermal imaging software. Who would have thought? But we do have it in Pivot. Here's that exact same video. There's the fire. And as you can see, the metal is really hot right there. But hot and cold are qualitative. Qualitative is really great up until about seventh grade. If you look at the science and engineering practices and you look at the cross cutting concepts, each one of them have a matrices. You can find these online. And if you don't want to find them, we're going into incredible detail about the matrices during NGSS week, which is week three. So I highly recommend check those out. But each of these matrices have this like stepping stone that moves between what is the expectation when we talk about things like heat, when we talk about energy transfer. Qualitative observations are the boundary line between 3.5 and 6.8. So when you look at the difference between upper elementary and middle school science, the difference in talking about temperature is that when you come into middle school, there's the expectation that we talk about temperature as a numeric output. The temperature in the room is 22 degrees centigrade. The temperature outside is not really hot. It's 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're going to translate that to centigrade, or we're going to look at it in Kelvin, or we're going to talk about it and pick your favorite temperature value. You could do anything you want, but it's a numeric thing. But these color conversions are where that number and color kind of blur. Because we know that each one of these colors is a part of a model. And that model is comparing a number to a quality, in this case, color. But we can measure that and pivot. If I come up here, I have this little tool. And hey, look at that. It says that that color of purple is 21.01 degrees Celsius. That's neat. Let's put it right there. Huh, 31.09. That is like almost hot. That's slightly below body temperature. Neat. Let's pull out a stopwatch. Let's see how long it takes for that spot to get too hot to touch. Boom. It's too hot. Back it up. Back it up. We said 35 degrees is too hot. Oh, there we go took 0.02 minutes from when I first started. It took 0.18 minutes since the start of the film. That's not a lot of time. That means that that rod is too hot to touch in less than half a minute, 30 seconds. Too hot, can't touch it, bad, burns. But down at the end, still perfectly touchable. I'm gonna ask my kids, what the heck just happened explain what's going on using as much science language as possible release them to their groups you could have them do this on a whiteboard you could have them do it inside a pivot in fact we give them the opportunity to answer both of those questions right here on the platform so you could just say type your answers in a pivot so we're automatically bringing you into that engagement step inside of the activity but this is also a really great time to start having them discuss this with their partners. So inside of Pivot, we tell you, consider this question for a whole class discussion. Once the students have engaged with it and we've gotten our, you know, why is that part not as hot as that part? We can have the students have in detail conversations and while they're having those conversations, I, I'm looking for misconceptions and gaps. Well, 
it got hot because the hot from the fire went into the metal and that spot is the closest to the fire so that means that it's going to be the hottest nah, ha, ha, ha. good things i picked out that they believe that this will always be the hottest part that they know that it has to do with like its proximity to the heat source they know that the heat's coming into it i wonder if i gave them the same thing but put an ice cube on it if they would have the same reaction that they think the heat is going into the ice cube or will they think that the cold is going into the metal because i know my kids are going to think that the cold is emanating across because there is an ice cube there but we know that cold is not really a thing it's heat and a lack of heat so i know that they know what hot is but they're not using the word heat hmm. i need them to use the word heat what is heat heat's energy cool okay nobody's really said energy yet i don't hear that i know they know heat i know i get an idea of like where are my students that is my engagement and i haven't had to grade anything i'm just looking at the responses now i see a great question any tips on how to grade written responses in pivot i have the best tip it's called grade by question let me show you it i'm going to log out and go into a teacher account where i have responses for you to see if my thing's going to let me log in aha there it goes. All right. So when I go to a class, I'm going to come over here. I have way too many classes here. Not that one. That one. Okay. So I'm going to come to this question. I just see I have a whole bunch of students in here. Some of you even maybe remember yourself from this class from last year. What you're going to do is do grade by question. And when you're in grade by question, you can select the questions that you want to grade. So I want to look at everybody's data table here. I'm going to do this anonymously because these are real people. Click grade. I see everyone's responses in one spot. So what you can do is, and these happen in the middle of the class, these update automatically as your students are working. So what you can do is say, I want everybody to look at I want everybody let's say this is my intro complete questions one two three and four in the first 15 minutes of class I'm going to come take a look at them when you're done and then what you can do is you can go into pivot into the grade by question select questions one two three four and you will see everybody's answers for those questions in one page and you just scroll and you can slap the answer key right next to it and you can actually grade them. And then if you wanna leave comments here, you're like, this is blank. You can save for that student and it's gonna to go to that student. This is an old activity. I've been using it for over a year. That's why that's giving me an error. So this is located when I leave this, I'll back it up. We'll go look at a different activity so it stops giving me this error when you click on an activity up at the top it says grade by question your account doesn't come with a key because it should come with a key if it's not it's because your account hasn't been vetted so i just need to vet it but i did clear out the vetting list this morning so it should have come with one but so when you're inside of the activity to get here, it is click on a class, click on a class that actually has work in it. There we go. Click on the assignment and then it says grade by question. And when you click grade by question, you'll see all of the questions. Now, just a note, I don't use grade by question for multiple choice and I don't use it for numerical auto grades because those are already graded. I find I don't get a ton of feedback from multiple choice questions. I don't gain a lot of information from having them answer like, what's the, what's the definition of density? I get my most information in open-ended questions like CER questions. Does grade by student pull up students who have not submitted yet? 
Yes, it does. It pulls up all students, no matter where they are inside of the activity. However, we come back to one that has students in it. We'll look at this biology one. When I click, we'll go over here. Open-ended question, grade and honestly, grade. Okay, notice that it tells me their grading status underneath the question. So I can see if they're pending, that means they submitted it. If it's in final grade, that means I graded it. And if the student hasn't submitted, let's see if I have anybody who hasn't submitted this one. Nope, it looks like everybody submitted this one. So if it hasn't submitted, you'll see a red error text that says the student has not submitted this activity yet. This is my most time saving one, because when you're in grade by question, we'll come up to one of these that actually has an answer in it. Okay. This is a student answer that is good. If they typed in literally anything, it's going to automatically give them full points. If it's correct, I can move on. If it's blank, the system leaves their score blank automatically, I keep scrolling. However, when they type in an answer like this that says my hypothesis is, this will give them full points and you override it. So the only ones that I'm actually grading and giving feedback on are the students who attempted it incorrectly, which is a fairly small portion of my students. So that means that all those kids that left it blank they saved me time. I just keep scrolling and all the kids who got it right, I just keep scrolling. They obviously know what they're doing. So I'm only looking for the kids that need my feedback. This is 45 questions, 45 student answers, and it would probably take me about three to four minutes to grade all of them because I'm just scrolling and looking for kids who did it wrong. Is request revision for the teacher to the student so that the student has to revise their answer? That's exactly right. When you request revision, what that does is it takes the student thing. So like here, if I request revision, it sends it back to the student and they can now go in and keep working on it. And then they can resubmit it to you. It's the, that is the pass back feature. All these are good questions. Do they do these activities by themselves? I feel like that would be a very quiet classroom and I love talking in organized chaos. That's a great question. The answer is that is entirely up to you. So, for example, say I want my kids to do, I'm gonna come over here, this activity here, balancing act. Okay. I'm gonna go to my class. I'm gonna go to first period. Nope. Let's go back to that summer series bio class that had students in it. I'm going to assign an activity. I'm going to assign that balancing act one assign. When you assign an activity, you have a bunch of different options. You can assign it to everybody or individuals or my personal favorite groups. So I can say I want this in six groups, random create. And that'll drop all of the kids into random groups. Then they're all working on the same activity together. So you're going to get that collaboration and that talking. And it's also one activity. Good question. What does the request revisions look like from the student perspective? So when you request revisions, they do not get a notification. The reason for that is we don't send emails to students other than forgot passwords, simply because your school's email system for students blocks all of our emails anyways. Most of your school systems are really finicky about what emails come to students. So they pretty much only ever get the emails that come from verified staff within the building and your learning management system. But when they come in to pivot, they will see, let me see if I can get into one here, go be a student. When they come in to pivot, they will see that Linda.Debweiler, their assignment has been given back as feedback. So like here, 
this has been pushed back to feedback status. When I log in, it says feedback. And when I view it, I can edit it again. So you can see I can still submit it for grades. I see my work. And I can go in there and keep working on this. So that's the status that's in there. We are actually working on our messaging and what that looks like. So expect that that may change in the next year. But right now, when they log in, they will see anything that's in request revisions in feedback. And they only get a score once you've marked it as graded, once you put it into that final grade status. So they don't see a score, at least not on this page, until you've marked it as graded. Whenever they're in an activity, though, they see their climbing score at the top of the page. That is the score that they've gotten with everything graded so far. This usually scares the bejeebus out of my students because they're like, I have a 3.3% misstep while I just got started. What happened? I'm like, you only answered one question right. I have to grade everything else. Give it time. So that's where that is. That's only for multiple questions. They will be scored. All multiple open choice and numeric auto grade. Yeah. So anything with auto grading, the score automatically updates. These are all fantastic questions. Keep them coming. Any others before I hop back? You can turn randomization on and off. Is that correct? Or is it just there? So it depends on a on some of our activities, the ones that are already randomized, it's just there. It's already randomized for you. You can make questions randomized. We actually have an entire training coming up on what the randomization component is and how to randomize things. So you can make things randomized. You could, in theory, therefore remove the randomization. I've found very few teachers that are like, no, I want everybody to have the exact same answers, but you could turn it off. Well, so if you and I are best buddies, which I feel confident we are, and I do it on A day and you do it on B day, um, it's possible, I, I wouldn't want to demean my school, that a student might be interested in putting in an auto graded answer or something that they got from their bestie that they did no work or thought for. So I'm just go. interested in, yeah, I mean, it, I'm sure that never happens for anybody else, but I'm just interested in, in how that kind of goes through the grinder and oh, yeah. that kind of, your thoughts on that. So I ran into that same situation too. And when you look at some of these, like this one is auto graded, but let me find one that's fully randomized. I come up here, I'm just going to search randomized. So this is a stoichiometry activity for chemistry and split question view. And here it says they're going to select trial one. There are 33 different trials for a stoic practice, which is really important because stoichiometry is one of those things where you just have to practice it. Like if you copy off of somebody, you do not understand stoichiometry. You have to practice it. If I refresh this page, I should, I'm trying to think if this one, yeah, now it says select trial two. If I refresh the page, now it says select trial six. There are 33 unique trials of this running around. So I have a one in 33 chance of getting any particular trial, which means me and Bestie probably don't have the same trial. So you can go up to him and ask him, what, did you, what was your answer? My answer was 12. Well, I had trial 14. What's really cool here is that by doing that, now the question becomes, how did you get the answer to question number one? Instead of what is the answer, it's how did you get the answer to number one? I like it when my students answer questions like that because now they're teaching process, not giving out answers. Less Chegg, more Google they are explaining their their understanding and the other student is learning from that and that's far more authentic than just did you get b for number two and we talked about how to find these but i included a slide just in case i forgot to talk about them now again inside that same exploration that thermal conductivity activity allows me so like I said, there's an engagement at the beginning of this, but 
we've automatically built in the introduction into this activity. So as the students are walking through this, we're going to call out things like thermal energy transfer. We're going to call out that the different types of metal impacts it. We're going to call out that the flame distance impacts it. We're going to call out all that information that I had already planned on discussing is designed to be discussed in this activity. So this becomes my exploration and a little bit of my engagement all in one area. I see the question. It says, I have a teacher friend who would really benefit from using Pivot. She's AP Chem and very nervous about it. any ideas to get her to consider. So when I started teaching chemistry, my push into digital resources for chemistry had nothing to do with having a computer and had everything to do with having a special needs child. Um, I actually very early into his life had an emergency situation where he was hospitalized and I wasn't able to come to school. And that quickly forced me to take my classroom and put it on a computer and I had to teach stoichiometry from a computer and I didn't die. My kids didn't die. Nobody lost their mind. Like students actually learned something. We practiced. I used the FET activity for that situation that was the uh, grilled cheese sandwich builder. And I was like, hey, my kids still learned chemistry. And I had no cleanup. I still had set up because I had to like find the resource and stuff, but my setup was way less. It graded like I had all my grading was a lot easier to do. They still had all the same experiences. It just had a computer. And I was like, ho, 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 ho. This is fantastic. And then I started getting lazy because I had more preps. And there were some labs that I just did not want to set up. So I started pushing into pivot in places where I was like, this saves me time. It saves me energy. I don't use pivot every week. This was two or three times a unit, maybe some units more, some units less. But the I think the idea that like, oh, if you get a tool like Pivot, you have to use it every week. That's a hog's wallop. Like, absolutely not. Use it where it makes sense. If that for you is four labs a year, fantastic. If that's once or twice a unit, have at it. If that's a lot during stoichiometry and not a lot during acid base, go to town that makes sense use it where it makes sense to you. And I think just finding one activity, that would be fantastic. So uh, great thing, bring them to these sessions, uh, send them these session recordings, or have them reach out to me. I would be more than happy to take 15 minutes and show them around the platform. That's a great way to do it. So there's a lot of different ways. For the sake of time, I'm going to move on to the next one. One thing I wanna point out, and I think this is something that we all know, but somebody just needs to remind us every once in a while. One person's explore is another person's evaluate. Just because it's an exploration in your class does not mean that it's always an exploration. Just because it is an introduction activity in Pivot does not mean that it's a good introduction for your class. So for example, this is an activity that I did inside of my chemistry class. It's ocean acidification. It's a super awesome activity. It's on coral bleaching. All my biology teachers are like, oh, really? Because <laughs> every biology teacher loves coral bleaching for ecology. But they watch a candle that burns. And as it burns, the indicator solution changes colors. And so it gets more acidic because the CO2 is dissolving into the water. This is a fantastic equilibrium activity and a fantastic equilibrium elaboration for my general chemistry students. For my gen chem students, this is at that upper echelon of going into of going into kinetics and going into equilibrium and going into acid base. This is my like, we're gonna merge all these units together into this one super activity. That's on their like top end. But for my AP kids, this is well within the realm of the AP world for chemistry. Doing something like this is totally within bounds for equilibrium. This is Le Chatelier's live and in person. 
this might be an explain. For my college students, this might just be an engagement where I'm pulling in their information to see if they've heard of Le Chatelier's and if they remember the principles of equilibrium. For my middle schoolers, we're not even touching this. I'm not bringing a 10 foot pole to Le Chatelier's with my middle schoolers because it's not within their realm. So just because an activity is a great introduction for one class doesn't mean it's gonna be a great introduction for your class. Think about where you are inside of their learning arc from K-12, where you are inside of your class's learning arc and their prior knowledge. So for the explain step, I like to do things where the students are gonna combine those two. These tend to be longer activities. I don't grade all of them and I don't grade every question of them. I usually pick out a couple activities to let me really hone in. So for example, this is an environmental science activity. It's on biomes and climates. You might have guessed that from the name biomes and climates. But this is a long activity. There's five different parts to it. And the students are going to work through how different components of a biome affect the climate of said biome. So they're going to look at the sunlight, the angle of the sun. Then as I come down here, all these multiple choice questions are auto graded. We're going to look at how does water impact it? So we could look at coastal winds or what if there's grass or what if there's snow? Gotta love that these are filmed in Minnesota. Snow is something that we have an abundance of access to. I, teaching in Florida, shockingly did not have snow very often. So this is something that my Florida environmental science students did not have access to. They can do all of these swaps really quickly. And I didn't set up a different booth for each one of these in my classroom for them to break. But this is my explain. I'm not grading this whole thing. There's too much there. Instead, at the end, there is an area called putting it all together. And it has just a couple of questions. There's four questions here. That's where I'm focusing my grading. Sure, did they do a whole bunch of other things in this activity? Absolutely. Are all those multiple choice questions as relevant? No. So I'm going to focus on just a couple of evaluation questions at the end to really get a feel for their learning. Because these are going to give me a lot more information than the multiple choice questions up above. I feel like in the explained area, a lot of us are like, but we need to have a quiz. You don't. You really don't. This can be anything that you're doing that evaluates them. I like to do things that are auto graded inside of pivot for this, particularly if, if it's a math skill. I think about stoichiometry. I think about energy calculations, momentum, anything math oriented I'm going to do as a pivot just because it auto grades and it gives them feedback based on their answers. So it's always pushing them to getting it right. And then everybody should end the class period with a 100 so i don't actually put that grade in the grade book because the goal is to end with a perfect score and not everybody got a perfect score so my i use those auto graded to really push them and get a sense for where they at and we are having a session entirely on alternative assessment later this week i believe it's on friday Then for elaboration, Pivot's really great for elaboration because Pivot really can be something that you set up with your kids and let them do over there. So I like that Pivot is something that, for example, if I'm a biology teacher doing genetics, I just did Mendelian genetics, single trait cross, and a quarter of my students have absolutely no idea what that was. 25% of them are okay, but they need some more work and the other 50% are fine. That 50% that's fine, I'm gonna give them a pivot and tell them go forth and conquer. Go over there, you don't need me. 
But those kids that do need me, I can then pull into a small group and focus with them. And my other students can go explore something that I may not have had time to get to. So for example, you may not do sex link genes inside of your classroom. So if that's not something that you're gonna have time to do, let Pivot do it for you. Here we've got an activity on linked genes. It's going to introduce them to everything that they need. And my personal favorite, all the flies are contained inside that video. I don't have to breed hundreds of fruit flies to which only you know 10% of them will escape. But that's a lot of flies escaping and my janitors can only tolerate so much of my science. But they can explore and go farther without me, so this really can be something that they do on their own once they have gotten used to pivot do not let their first time ever using the platform be the time where you're like go forth and do this on your own. Also, I use this to do elaborations that simply don't fit inside my class. So for example, I do this with things where I have missing or aged equipment. For example, Beer's Law, if you're an AP Chem teacher, I had a SpectroViz in my room. It was made in the 80s. It was a big gray box one. It had like the single cuvette and it gave you the analog output for uh, the wavelength. I had one. And whether or not it worked was entirely dependent on the mood of the machine and not my ability to plug it in. So I didn't rely on it. And I knew my school wasn't going to buy another one. Surprisingly, didn't have that many Newton's cradles left in my classroom. So instead of pulling out one and demoing it, I let the kids play with it. Sometimes it's hazardous, uh, hazardous chemicals. I don't keep ethanol. Well, I keep ethanol in the building, but I don't keep kerosene in the building. Kerosene requires special flammable uh, storage that I just don't feel like dedicating to. So I couldn't do this demonstration in my classroom. A lot of the gases that are inside of this, I could go get the gas tanks and hook them up inside my lab and have them secure, but I hate dealing with the gas chains that you need. And I don't like purchasing gases or handling gases. So a lot of times I just didn't purchase many of them. It could be that I have limited expertise. I'm not the genius in biology. If you asked me to teach biology, I would not have any clue what I was doing. So having labs that are already set up and done the right way that give the right results are super helpful for me because I can learn with the activity. And sometimes it's just setting up the experiment to run. Titrations take forever. It takes 10 minutes to set up a titration to get data that they're going to overshoot so many times it's ridiculous and they're going to get horrible data. Or we let them run it again. Well, they do three or four titrations and they still don't get a good equilibrium point. Or my personal favorite, they just take too long to run the experiment itself. Every one of these has a 15 to 20 minute setup inside of my classroom. My class periods are 45 minutes long. I don't have time for that. So I need to save time so that we can focus that time on educational things. And then for evaluation, we do actually have activities inside of Pivot that are specifically designed to be assessments. You can find those inside of the end, but just a reminder, everything you do in your classroom is an evaluation. Everything gives you data. Everything gives you information about your students. They're all evaluations. So if you don't do like a sit and get unit test at the end, you're not alone. Your school may require you to do a summative assessment at the end of the unit. I tended to use labs, things like pivot as my summative assessments, but I did also do things that were like argumentative questions or tippers or those like student A and student B have this argument explain those would be my uh, my final assessments they don't need to be traditional tests in the sense of here's a 20 question multiple choice go forth and conquer 
So a full unit lesson, and since we're kind of low on time, I want to make sure I get through this. So an example of using pivot throughout a lesson because we're going to look at one this is on forces and interaction and so if i'm teaching a freshman physics course or an ngss physics class the question i might explore inside of a forces unit is when a boxer is training on a punching bag does the bag ever hit back and so let's look at this i want them to come out of this knowing newton's three laws of motion And here's kind of what that's going to look like inside of my room. And we're actually going to continue using the same phenomenon in all of them. And so my question is, if the if the boxer punches the bag, does the bag ever punch them back? And so I may release that to my kids to discuss. That's their opening question. And they'll whiteboard it. They'll discuss it in groups. We'll do think pair share any of those methods, but just capture their initial responses. And then we're going to come into pivot. I'm going to say, how would I set this up so that this could be a model for our question, that boxer versus the punching bag? And they're going to say, well, the boxer is heavy. So the right hand side, that one's going to be heavy and our left side is going to be light. And the punching bag initially is not moving and on the right it's going really fast because they're going to just punch out as fast as they can and the bag's just going to lay there like a bag i would expect to see that the hand would punch through the system would punch through the bag and the bag would just move away okay let's see so heavy light fast zero load so there's my zero it punched away, but when they made contact, huh, they're both squished. That's weird. What just happened? That is now my explore phase. Now my students are going to explore this idea and they have rulers. They can pull this out, zero it and see, man, it is the same on both sides. Maybe I haven't even said Newton's laws, but they figured out that it's the same, just in different directions. Hmm. That seems important. And then maybe I say, go figure out a way where it doesn't work like this. They can try every single situation inside of this. None of them will give you an imbalance force. So we could build Newton's laws from this activity. This becomes my engagement and it kind of becomes my exploration without really paying any attention to these questions. You could delete all the questions inside of these and just use it as a demo. But if you do put, leave the questions in there, we give them space to answer all this and kind of walk them through it. So you don't have to set it up. So I could use the same activity in multiple points inside of my unit plan. This could be my exploration. This could be my explanation where I'm like, okay, we've been talking about Newton's laws explain why it is that if I leave this one without motion and I just ram this other one into it, why does the, what happens and why does it happen? This could be my elaboration. If I'm working with middle school students where we haven't really talked about collisions yet, this could be their opportunity to really get in and play with collisions and build models. This could even be my evaluation to see how the students interact with the model and what conclusions they can draw from it. I can use this in multiple points throughout my unit plan, all in one easy area. So with that, I wanna wrap this up and open this up for any questions. We've been answering questions throughout, so I would not be surprised if some of you are all out of questions, but I definitely wanna give you a chance to ask all of them you could have.